the Sermon on the Mount points us to one inevitable conclusion. It's all about Him having His way in our lives. Let's keep asking Him to empower us to live lives of honesty and integrity. We live in a world that is more connected than ever before. We have at our fingertips the ability to communicate with people across the globe in an instant. At any hour of the day, we're one click away from creating or sharing information worldwide. As Christ followers, we have been commissioned to share the gospel with all nations. Living Truth is on the air 52 weeks of the year, endeavoring to use media to do just that. For decades, Living Truth has followed God's lead in sharing resources to grow in faith. We are gospel-centered and globally engaged. Through platforms like television, radio, and digital media, we have the ability to transcend borders and translate languages to deliver God-breathed scripture beyond all sorts of barriers. Living Truth produces clear biblical teaching that allows people to experience Christ in their own homes, across the street, across our nation, and around the world. For some who are unable to attend a local church, Living Truth is their church community. God is using this ministry to reach the masses. Summertime is a financially critical season for us, and we depend on viewers like you for continued financial support. In a ministry of this scope, there are ever-present production costs. We're halfway through the year, and we rely entirely on viewer support to top up our ongoing creative costs and keep us on sound financial footing. We're reaching out to loyal supporters like you to ask you to help us reach our goal of $250,000 for our production fund. To help support our production costs, send a check to the address on your screen. To donate with a credit card, call toll-free 1-888-269-6085. You can also make a secure donation by visiting us online. Living Truth is a registered charity and all donations are tax deductible. We invite you to join us, of course to continue to gather with us, but also to engage the world with the good news by financially supporting Living Truth. Your prayers and financial support are critical for our ministry. We can't do this without you. Thank you for your faithful partnership. We wish you and yours a wonderful summer. God bless you. Would you consider yourself to be a liar? Probably not, but you might acknowledge occasions when you're economical with the truth. Brett McBride continues his series on the Sermon on the Mount and in this message, he examines where Jesus is challenging both our honesty and integrity. Our words matter to God, and He wants us to use them wisely. This is Living Truth. Good morning, church. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 5. I've entitled this message, Redeeming Honesty, because we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount Jesus is unpacking what we know as six antithesis statements. He makes a reference to an Old Testament law and principle, and he begins to address areas in which the culture of his day had strayed from what God intended. And Jesus is burying his disciples under the implications of the law but at the same time declaring that he has come to fulfill them. And so just as he's unpacking holy living and righteousness, he's leading his disciples into a deeper walk with him because he is the means by which we live the Christian life. We'll look at that later. Jesus is now turning his attention to an area of life where each of us in this room, if we're honest, 
have struggles at different periods or moments in our life, Jesus starts to talk about honesty. And in Matthew 5, verse 33, we read this. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. The average person, deception experts say, lies 10 to 200 times a day. This is an issue in our lives, amen? And, and as I was sitting and thinking about the realities of this, I started to do inventory in my own life, and sometimes I'll be out to a meal, I'll have lunch out or dinner out, and the server at the end of the meal will come and say, did you enjoy your meal? And I might have been like, meh, it was okay. But I go, yes, it was delicious, thank you. <laughs> so sometimes we're telling little white lies that are trying to be polite, but we're not actually speaking truthfully. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes to what lies beneath the surface of our lives, what is at the heart of our lives. He's confronting the misinterpretations of his day, the ways in which the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, those who knew the word, had taken Old Testament principles and strayed to applications that God never intended. And he turns his attention to the whole topic of oaths and vows, integrity and honesty. What I want to do this morning is just take a few moments to look at some Old Testament passages that gives us an understanding of what vows and oaths purpose was, and then we'll look at the New Testament practices and see why Jesus brings this up. A vow in the Old Testament was a solemn promise made to God to deliberately and freely perform some good work. They weren't obliged to be made, but people wanted to show their dedication to God, so they would make a vow or take an oath in his name to do some good deed. Vows were a part of everyday life in the Old Testament, and so God wrote them into his law, and he wanted to show how important it was for his people to keep their vows. He wrote a multitude of verses to give them instruction in this area because he wanted them to be people of their word. Now, a vow was a promise to do something for God. An oath was invoking God's name to undergird a statement or promise I've made. An oath might sound like this. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I don't do whatever I had vowed to do. So it was generally used in solemn occasions like lawsuits or state affairs in order to add weight to a vow that somebody made. So let's just look at a few verses. In Numbers chapter 30, we read this in verse 2. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. So basically what God's saying to his people is, be people of integrity. If you say you're going to do something, follow it through. Just do it. Carry it out. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21, we read this. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it, for the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do, because you made your vow freely to the Lord your God with your own mouth." So as much as vows were to display our dedication to God, they were also meant to make people think carefully about the words that were coming out of your mouth, because he wants us to live what we commit to do with our words. And as I was studying this and thinking about this whole area of life, I began to realize that vows are still practiced in our lives today. Sometimes when we're facing difficult moments in life, sometimes when we're ill or having a rough go of things, we will utter a prayer to God 
a plea for help, and we will tag on to that prayer a commitment to do something for him. Lord, if you can just take this away from me, this source of pain, this illness, I will serve you faithfully forever. That's your prayer of desperation in moments of sickness. And, and for all intents and purposes, you've made a vow. Or maybe there's moments in life where we see something that we really, really want. And so in our youthfulness, maybe we pray and say, Lord, if you just let me meet so-and-so because I really want to meet them. Or if you just allow me to get that car, Lord, I will never eat chocolate again. And, and we utter a vow, and then a few months later, we're gorging on chocolate because we forgot the words that came out of our mouths. A faith promise is like a pledge. It's a commitment. It's a promise between you and God to give such amount of money to global missions, so we still practice these things today. When you go to a wedding, you witness two people getting joined together before God, and they exchange vows. So we see these practices still in our day and age, and for God's covenant people, integrity mattered. God is teaching them to be people of their word. Vows and oaths had moved from simple honesty in the Old Testament to complex theology in the New Testament. And in Matthew's gospel, Jesus confronts the Pharisees for this abuse. In Matthew 23, verse 16, Jesus says this to the Pharisees, "'Woe to you, blind guides! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath.'" You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Why Jesus is confronting them and why he's bringing this up in the Sermon on the Mount is that they had created an elaborate system whereby you weren't swearing by his name, but by objects closely associated with his name. It was a theological game to them. They were making vows with no intention whatsoever of fulfilling what they were saying. What was meant to cultivate honesty and integrity had been abused and was being used for dishonest purposes. Someone would make a vow and make a commitment, say they were going to do something, and swear by the altar. And then when they didn't do it and were called to task for it, they would say, well, that oath isn't binding. It's only if I swore by the gold on the altar that it was binding. They were playing all kinds of theological games. It was like if I committed to do something for you, but I had my fingers crossed. And I go, oh, my fingers were crossed. Doesn't count. And Jesus is saying to them, for all intents and purposes, stop playing games. They were playing with the letter of the law and ignoring the spirit of the law. And Jesus is saying in Matthew 5, it's all under his dominion. The words that come out of your mouth, you should do them. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, because heaven is God's throne, the earth is his footstool, Jerusalem is the city of the great king, and even the hair on your head is under his domain. Jesus is removing the curtain of self-righteousness and exposing the hypocrisy of the religious subculture of his day. And when we play theological games and we try to do these dances with theology around God, when we try to tamper with his word and we allow dishonesty to take root in our hearts, in our lives, Jesus' words to us are the same as his words to the Pharisees. Woe to you, blind guides. You blind fools, you blind men, you're wandering down a path and you cannot see where you're going. Your words and your actions don't line up. You don't live what you vow. You talk the talk, but do you walk the walk? The culture of Jesus' day thought that they could take a part of the law like vows and owls, play games with it, and still claim righteousness before God. And Jesus is showing them how far from holiness 
they had strayed. I mean, even when you look at the Old Testament laws about being people of our word, it begs the question, why did God include so many verses on this in the first place? Why did he provide such specific and detailed instructions about the importance of keeping your word? Did he write this into his law because his people were so honest? Did he have to write this into his law because they always did what they said? No, it's the exact opposite. It's because people are dishonest that God even included it into the law in the first place. It was because of the fall in Genesis 3, we began to lie to God and one another when sin entered our condition. We were created to be honest, but sin produced dishonesty within us. Even science displays that we were created for honesty. Science has done so much research on deception and the impact it has on our physical life. Our bodies have a physical reaction when we lie. Listen to what happens when you tell a lie. The moment you lie, the stress of formulating a story causes your nervous system to release cortisol into your brain. Your heartbeat quickens, your pupils dilate, and you begin to sweat. Do you remember that when you were a kid? Did you eat that cookie? No. Sweating, pupils dilating, cortisol being dumped into your brain. After a few minutes, your brain has to keep track of what you know and what you told the other person. As a result of this increased workload, you start making poor decisions because your brain is firing so much. With more time, people often become angry towards the person that they told the lie to. They lash out in order to shift the focus off their dishonesty and onto something else. After the initial lie is over, the stress hormones start to dissipate, but often worry begins to set in because you have to remember everything you said. Prolonged deception causes chronic anxiety. The continuing circulation of stress hormones like cortisol in our brain hurts our ability to think clearly, and it begins to depress our immune system. As a result, you are more likely to contract illnesses. You may also have trouble sleeping, which intensifies the whole cycle. This is what happens when we tell a lie to our bodies. Our bodies physically react. We were made to be honest. That's why our body's trying to tell us, get back to honesty. We were made in his image, and there's evidence of his fingerprints in our lives because when we tell these lies, our bodies are having a strong reaction. Dishonesty has become prevalent in our society. I was thinking to myself, it would be nice to put our political leaders under oath before a debate, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be nice to say to them, place your hand here, please raise your right hand, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Do you commit that if you make a vow or a promise, you are actually going to fulfill it when you get into office? Like, like, it's binding. This is legal. You can impeach yourself here. Wouldn't that be great? It would probably change. It would be the most silent debate ever. It'd just be like, I don't want to impeach myself. Dishonesty has become prevalent in our society. And Moses included vows and oaths into his law because, again, God is meeting his people where they're at. He's realistic about the sin condition in our lives, and he starts to cultivate an awareness of the importance of honesty in the Old Testament, but Jesus takes it so much further in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' teaching is radical and probably very convicting for the disciples who are listening because it was common practice in Jesus' day to make all kinds of vows and oaths in the name of objects and not actually fulfill them. And Jesus is saying, that's all wrong. That comes from the deceiver. Just simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. And it cuts to the heart. But at the same time that Jesus is going to the heart of our lives and exposing our inability, he is actually revealing his plan for redemption. Right before speaking about this topic in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says to his disciples, I have not come to abolish the Old Testament law and prophets. I've come to fulfill it. 
to take it further than you could have ever imagined. I've come to do this because I am God with you. I am the fulfillment of righteousness. I am the fulfillment of holiness. I always tell the truth. I never lie. My life is in line with the words that come out of my mouth. There is no duplicity in me. I am what it looks like to love God and love others. I am honesty and truth among you. That's what Jesus is saying when he said, I have come to fulfill it. And as you move through the Sermon on the Mount, you begin to notice God's redemptive movement throughout Scripture. The law and the prophets in the Old Testament, they were never meant to be the finished product. The Old Testament didn't contain all answers or an entire list of ideal ethics for life. The whole of the Old Testament was designed to meet the people where they were at and lead them towards God's intended purposes discovered in the person of Christ. God is moving his people throughout Scripture towards the redemption of what was broken. He's leading them to Christ himself. The Sermon on the Mount points us to one inevitable conclusion. It's all about him having his way in our lives. The law and the prophets were meant to lead us to a righteousness from God, a righteousness outside of ourselves. They were designed to lead us to the person of Christ. The law and the prophets are pointing to one inevitable conclusion, the Christ who stands among us and says, I am here to fulfill what you cannot fulfill. I am your righteousness. Romans 1.17 says that, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. Our righteousness is from him. And when he comes into our lives, his redemptive movement begins to cultivate honesty and integrity, love for our enemies, a love that is indescribable because it is from him. Major Ian Thomas, one of the founders of Cape and Ray Bible Schools, put it this way, the one who calls you to a life of righteousness is the one who, by our consent, lives that life of righteousness through you. When Jesus comes into our lives, he redeems every part of our lives. So let me ask you, church, today, how's your integrity? Are you honest at your workplace, do you do what is ethical and upright? When you see dishonesty, do you confront it? In your relationships, do you speak well of others in front of them and behind their backs? We all face moments of failure. Peter, on the night he betrayed Christ, promised with an oath that he did not know Jesus. But because of God's redemptive movement, Jesus met him in his failure called him back to relationship and began to redeem honesty in him again. So let's close with this thought. I would just ask that you close your eyes now. As we have our eyes closed, I want you to imagine a world where everyone tells the truth, a world where people operate with integrity and honesty. I want you to imagine a world where nobody is cheated out of their wages, a world where the poor aren't exploited, a world where trust in business, in personal relationships can flourish, a world where his light and his joy and his honesty shines in the everyday places of our lives. Father, we pray that by the power of Christ at work within us, according to your redemption in our lives, may we go from this place today and make the world that type of place. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus has called his disciples out into the mountains he starts to preach the Sermon on the Mount. He's having them rethink their religion, rethink their relationships, and that's why we've entitled this whole series, Rethinking. To order this series, call toll-free 
1-800-242-6085 or simply visit us online. Jesus introduced a form of leadership our world can't even comprehend. It can be difficult for us to think carefully about our words, yet easy for us to make small, unethical choices. But still we yearn to honor God with our mouths and our actions. We want others to see that because they can trust us, they can trust the God we serve. Let's keep asking Him to empower us to live lives of honesty and integrity. Join us next time for more Living Truth. We love to hear from you. Send your comments through our website. Living Truth is supported by viewers like you. Thanks to your financial participation, lives are being transformed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Living Truth is a registered charity and donations receive a tax receipt. To watch this message again, visit our website, download transcripts, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional, or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcasts. You can also join us on Facebook and YouTube. Tune in next week for part five of this series and a message called Overcome by Grace. This is Living Truth.